Welcome, 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 my bows and bow ties to another video with me. I am the Black Opinionated Woman, also known as a bow. All right, I had wanted to play um, my intro because I have not played that in a while because, you know, people don't want to see that all the time, but that was more for me. So uh, anyway, so this is what we're talking about today. We're going to talk about um, episode four from the Writer's Room podcast, HBO Max, a Writer's Room podcast that was um, basically the writer's, um, I guess, conversation in regards to the Sex and the City reboot um, and just like that. So we're going to review episode four. Um, for those of you who are new to my channel, I talk about three things. Black woman, Black culture, and anything related to being middle-aged. So, um, and I do consider this particular show to be part of the whole middle-aged thing. So while I get myself situated, I'm struggling with this light situation because I feel like it washes me out. And if I turn it off, I don't I don't know what's going on. So I've been experimenting and there's different um, settings for this. So just work with me. All right. So anyway, these are my both thoughts on episode four. Let me take that off. Um, so if you came here, you selected this thumbnail, take a good look at it. So I'm pretty sure for those of you who can read and write and walk and swing your arms at the same time, I think you understand where I'm going to go with this particular, uh, <laughs> you're funny. <laughs> uh, so you know where I'm going to go with this, um, this episode here. So let's, let's get right into it. Um, for those of you who are going to be joining in shortly, welcome, welcome, welcome. All right. So what I want to do, um, let me go ahead and change the view of this for a second because, you know, I'm on a struggle bus today. Can you guys see that? I should probably move over to this side. Okay. So I just want to start right off with, um, can you guys see this for a second? Take a look. The um the woman there to the left, her name is Kelly Goff. She is one of the newer writers for this um show. Uh, she was brought in to, I guess, flush out some of the newer uh, characters, in particular, the brown characters who have been added to the show. All right, so let me get my life back together. All right, uh, maybe I should leave this up for a second. So, okay, let's just talk about it. Um. <sighs> I think I like her. Now, I think when I did the recap of episodes one and two, it was a combined recap. We had Samantha Irby. She was the other black woman. I can't take it. I don't know who this chick is. I just don't think she was. I, I don't know why they selected her to be the representation for the blackity black blacks. But um, this lady here, Kelly Goff, um, she seems to be... Um, yeah. And it kind of makes sense that I kind of resonated a little bit with what she had to say, because if I remember correctly, she also that episode was the one where I thought that uh, Miranda had a little bit of her um, humanity left. So anyway, this um, Kelly Goff, I think it makes sense why I halfway liked this particular um, recap from the writers. Now, let, let's get right on into it. So basically, they open up, they introduce Kelly Goff, and then there's the um, executive producers, um, Julie Rottenberg and Eliza Zeritsky. So basically, it starts off with Kelly Goff admitting that she's a super fan of the previous version, which is Sex in the City. Um, they brought her in to flush out these new characters, she and she claimed to be some sort of Michael Patrick uh, King stalker. So basically, it was like another suck-up moment. It was another you know, preening, you know, as we said, like these, these writers like to um, preen and lick themselves because I think they act like cats. So, but anyway, so she was just going on and on how she was fawning over this meeting. She was explaining to her mom, like, Hey, I got a meeting with Michael, Michael Patrick King, blah, blah, blah. And so basically it was an opportunity. And so um, basically she um, cops to or admits to being a combination of both Carrie and Charlotte, as far as the personalities goes, but let's get on into, um, what, what I really want to get into. So Michael Patrick King basically says that they wanted to start out with that art scene. And basically 
they really wanted to bring in these new characters. They wanted to introduce these new characters. And I think in particular, they really wanted to showcase the diversity among diversity, right? So this is where Kelly Goff comes in. And she actually said a lot of really good things, it's not just about this scene, but basically she said it was really important for the viewers to see um, Black people in another setting. So yes, you do have like these so-called black elite and they, they talk about art and all these other things. And so she thought it was quite important to showcase that diversity among the diverse group of people, which I could kind of dig. Now, granted, there was um, some gaffes that happened there because you got Ding Dong Charlotte who, um... all right, so look, let me just, let me just keep in, in, in line here with how I had my notes. So Charlotte, I guess, you know, we were talking about all these so-called woke moments, all these conscious moments. So basically, Charlotte, in this episode, wanted to really, like, just make herself, hold on a second. I think my family doesn't realize I'm live. Hey, guys, I'm live! So um, Charlotte wanted to basically showcase, like, hey, we I have a diverse set of friends. And she was like, how come we don't hang out with our Black friends and all this other stuff? So it was all about Charlotte trying to um, gain um, this, this, these black friendships. Okay. Um, so she, she was originally supposed to invite people to her home, but instead she gets invited to, uh, LTW, Lisa Todd Wexley, which is, um, Nicole Ari Parker, um, characters home. And so basically they said this was the blackest episode in the history of the franchise. And actually, to be honest, if we're calling a thing, a thing is true. That was the most black people in one room I had ever seen. So basically, um, what they were saying was in this episode, they wanted to take the time to point out a lot of the social aspects, but then also the personal aspects and like how in our current society, um, we do tend to still segregate ourselves. Um, to be honest, I, I get it. Like, um, I have, um, friends when I have my multicultural friends and then there's, there's times when I'm around people who look like me, um, in my opinion, now this is the thing, when we talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, all of the stuff like that, I know we've heard a lot of these terms. I don't necessarily always think it's wrong when a group of people who look like themselves get together and, and, and share and drink, break bread, um, culture, or whatever like that. I don't think it's necessarily wrong. I just think that when you're in certain environments, you have to show what is natural, right? When it is multicultural. Furthermore, I would say, even though the writers in the way that they wrote Charlotte was raggedy, like she's just, she just overacted or maybe underacted. I don't know because she does the weird thing with the, the, the seizure acting in the hands and the, I don't know. I think when you talk about modern day society, our current society, that actually is like a real thing. Okay. Uh, at the end, like think about even like on Sundays for those of you who, who, um, go to church or who, who practice the Christian faith, I would say even Jews or whatever. So we all know that come Sunday, that is the most segregated hour in the United States or hour and a half, two hours or however long you're in church. So I think that that was a little bit more, maybe not what's not normal is to see access to so-called the black elite or the black wealth. But what is normal is that in our current society, we do still tend to segregate ourselves, even if we do have multicultural friends, right? Um, oftentimes I, I think that we, um, we don't necessarily distinguish relationships versus friendships, right? Like we have these relationships, these multicultural relationships, work relationships, school relationships, ships, etc. But in order for, in my opinion, for it to be real friendships, you have to be willing to go into each other's spaces and be uncomfortable. Okay. So that's when I start to distinguish what is considered a friend. Are you willing to come into my space like I would be willing to go into your space? If you're not willing to go into each other's spaces and get uncomfortable, then I don't know if I really consider that a friendship. And I would say furthermore, before I, I, I get back on point, um, oftentimes when I talk to um, white people, I had to point this out, um, and, and this may seem uncomfortable. Oftentimes, many white people will say things like, well, I do have white friends. I mean, I'm sorry, black friends, and they come over. And to me, I think that's a wonderful thing. 
But when they say those things, I'm like, but let me ask you a question. How often do you go into their spaces? And when you say that you have these close relationships, is it primarily in on your turf, you know, in your spaces? So anyway, I thought it was interesting that they wanted to show this diversity among black wealth. Um, and they were showing Charlotte, ding dong Charlotte going into this black space. And it is uncomfortable because she, she was a ding -a So anyway, so now she wants to have these blackly black, black friends. But like I said, Kelly Gaw, my understanding is the way she helped write some of this. I think she did a good job as far as pointing out the other side of the coin. Now, maybe Charlotte and her ding dongery didn't work out, but what the writers did, I, I and this makes sense why I think I halfway like this episode. Um, so now they wanted to show that um, there was this diverse life, okay? Um, and what the, one of the questions that they mentioned was, why aren't more Americans diverse in their personal lives? This is like real. This is all the way real. Um, I know black people who don't necessarily feel comfortable with bringing white people into their spaces. And now for those of you who are watching, let me, let me point this out for a second. Um, black people already have to interact outside of their, their safe spaces every day. They have to go into workspaces, um, places where they have to shop, um, work out, uh, whatever. OK, so when they are home or when they're around, you know, the people, you know, when we're around the culture, we're using all forms of Ave, African-American vernacular English, otherwise or previously known as Ebonics. Um, that's like a safe space. It's like a place where you can go and there's no judgment there. Right. So we can just split verbs and everything else. Um, so I just thought it was interesting that this was forced onto Charlotte, like coming into these black spaces. Now she didn't get like the regular old regular black person. Right. So she went into a space that was where you had like the black elite, but I understood that sentiment, what they were talking about. So then like there wasn't as much of the writer's licking themselves like a self-licking ice cream cone right like self-serving themselves right it wasn't as much preening in this particular episode um but anyway they they made the comment you know michael patrick king made the comment that charlotte was basically an adult in the playground making new friends so i was kind of like really at 55 though because generally speaking we don't make new friends at like 55 or whatever right I don't think that's necessarily realistic. I'm not saying it's impossible, but usually, let me take that back. Let me take that back. I think the only time you make new friends is when you retire and move someplace else. But generally speaking, in your, your 50s, you're not making new friends. Um, I, I just don't see that happening, but I got the sentiment. So basically they were just trying to poke fun at people trying hard. Um, they were, okay, so this is what they said. And the, the writers said that they were poking fun at basically maybe uh, white America who, I guess, is working hard and trying to read books, but they were still missing the mark. I get it. People do miss it all the time. Um, but, you know, I get it. So um, one of the things was, um, let me see, blah, 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 blah. Um, I just wanted to say there was this, well, okay, I don't want to skip too far ahead. So one of the things I wrote down was um, Kelly Goff mentioned that, okay, so she wanted to show diversity within diversity and she wanted to show the diversity of black womanhood, which I thought was important because um, the way the media portrays black women is like, we're, we're constantly angry, right? They don't show us in these, these areas of vulnerability unless they're propping up like some sort of mascot, like Fandy Newton, um, a couple of days ago, like she's all the way ding dong, but they don't typically show us being vulnerable. Um, they don't show black women as uh, uh, caring. Right. So like this, there's this whole, um, I don't know if I'm using the right words, but I think the reason why um, move my stuff over here, that there's this, like when, when a young black male is, is um, snuffed out when his life is taken there, there's no humanity showing. For, the, for women and, and men, and men. Like they don't show that humanity in the community, right? They don't show that diversity of what is 
a black woman, what we see is is the negative images and these these stereotypical archetypes that are shown on television. So what she was saying was she was trying to show that there is this diverse black woman, like the black women are not a monolith, right? So, um, I mean, just look at me, I'm perfect in every way, even with the dark eyes, you know, <laughs> I'm going through it. Um, so anyway, she wanted to show that level of diversity. So I kind of got it. I mean, it was a little bit of not too much of a preening, but there was less preening in this episode. And I think maybe I'm just kind of like scarred for life after episode one and two with Samantha Irby just doing too much. And they, they were like propping her up as like, I, I don't know what that was. Like, I still feel like I need to have a conversation with her um, because she, the way she talked about women and aging and everything else, I was like, she was doing too much. She is not a representation of what I think black women are because she just sounded like an all the way ding a -ling. But Kelly Goff, for some reason, I don't know why. I know a lot of people are mad at the show, but for whatever reasons, this writer's podcast writers room podcast when I li I listened intentionally and I was like okay I can halfway rock with what's going on here because I remember when I watched that episode I was like okay this is interesting I didn't like all the way hate it maybe a little bit because Miranda was stupid she had her moments of coolness which is coming up so anyway what she said was when she was trying to show this diversity among diversity, she said it reminded her, she called out Whitley Gilbert. Now, I don't know how many of you know who Whitley Gilbert is. Now, for my blackity black blacks, we know exactly who Whitley Gilbert was. She was the character played by Jasmine Guy in the show, um, in the series, um, A Different World. A Different World was a spinoff from The Cosby Show. Originally, Lisa Bonet was in that before she got knocked up, um, I think by Lenny Kravitz or was. So they brought in what would be her replacement. So when Jasmine Guy, and I saw the documentary on that too, um, from a different world, it wasn't a real documentary, but anyway, when Jasmine Guy came on to that particular series, she basically said, um, she said, uh, oh, I'm going to bring that up for a second. When Jasmine Guy came on the series, she said, I had to be different. I can't just be like this replacement to Lisa Bonet. And by the way, when I was younger, I look just like Lisa Bonet. I even went to a camp and people were like, Lisa Bonet, Lisa Bonet. <laughs> anyway, I digress. So anyway, for Black people who are watching this, Whitley Gilbert represented this, this Black elite, the Black bourgeois. Now, I don't know if white people and Asian people and Latina know, Latinas know this, but there is a society, or I shouldn't call it a society, there's a group, it's called Jack and Jill. Now, it's not supposed to be for the elite, but that's kind of like what it is. Um, it's supposed to be a place where black children can get together and see people like them and grow up and have representation. But maybe they live in areas where there's not enough people who look like them. And they there's, there's a lot that goes into it, scholarship opportunities, um, community service. But it's a place where, you know, black children can see other children like them and, and, and um, get like etiquette and, and just fellowship and some other things and someone else can correct me. So it reminds me of like a Jack and Jill type of thing. So when Kelly Goff was mentioning, she wanted to show this other side of when you're, you know, bringing on like a diverse cast, but within that diverse cast, there is diversity. And so she said, she thought of Whitley Gilbert. Okay. Let me bring this up. So she said, I think, I think what you're saying about stereotyping makes tremendous sense. Absolutely. Right. And she said, I remember Whitley. So, yeah, well, I'm glad that you know about Whitley because, you know, some people don't watch other shows. Right. So um, I think the biggest thing was she she kind of like when, when she started breaking that down, I was like, OK, Kelly, see, at least you're making sense. Unlike Samantha Irby. I have words for that check. All right. So I just wanted to lean in on that for a moment because. Um, as, you know, a regular blackity black black, I wanted to make sure that whoever's listening to me, there's a reason why, for whatever reasons, what she was saying resonated for me. Um, anyway, just showing that diversity wrong black women, you know. So I would say this too, you know, there's so many times I would go someplace, um, depending on who I'm talking to or whatever. I mean, I've had all the microaggressions, 
oh, you seem so nice. I'm like, why would I not be nice? <laughs> I mean, unless you try me, but, but even still, like I was talking with some um, neighbor friends the other day and we were talking about what happens when you go to work. And I made the comment because they were talking about like some people may yell, some people don't, some people were stay at home moms. And I made the comment. I'm like, well, I generally don't yell at work. I just don't like, well, and also I have the kind of personality I don't need to because I have a really obnoxious way of making you really just irrelevant. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, that's just, you know, everyone has their way. It's very rare that you're going to see me yell. Like, I, I just don't need to. Um, I'll just make you irrelevant. I'll just make you a non-factor. And also, if you continue to try me and if you're going to try to do something where it's like subversive behavior, I have a way of embarrassing you. With, but it's so it's just so like low key. And I'll just let you embarrass yourself. I'll let you own yourself, but I digress. So anyway, when, you, when you're when used to experiencing all the little microaggressions, like, oh, is that your hair? I didn't know you had real hair. And I'm just like, I I, I want to slap you right now, but I can't, right? But I'm just kind of like, I, I let me just say this and I'm going to move on. You know, when Black women are wearing their hair in these huge puffs, right? It's like a, a real, in my opinion, very pretty puff and everything like that. A lot of white people don't understand that um, the hair in this fully stretched state is actually really long. So when people, like when I would wear my hair, my little tiny little afro like this, can you see me? And then I would like stretch it all the way up there like, oh my gosh, like what, what just happened? I'm like, I just straightened my hair. That's it. Nothing major. They didn't know if it was weave. If it was, I was just like, Lord Jesus. I digress. So now I'm glad that she took the time to break that down to say I wanted to show the diversity among diversity. So um, it was quite educational. So then anyway, then they had to go F it up with Charlotte, right? So Charlotte comes in and then mistakes one of the black people or the black women there for another black woman, right? Now, that's not uncommon. What what was dumb was they were talking about how like she just tried to double down and be like, are you sure you're not her? Are you sure your daughter doesn't go to this school? And you know, the mom or whatever was like, I'm pretty sure that I'm not her and that my daughter's, you know. So I just kind of felt like doing too much. You could have just had her have the major gaffe and you could have pulled back. So this is the thing. I feel like with the writers, the reason why I get so irritated is I think the writers make the assumption that the viewer is dumb. I'm like, the viewer's not dumb. And the way that they're trying to invoke consciousness, in my opinion, it's trying to paint white women as stupid as you know what, like, and I'm like, my goodness, or maybe I just happen to be around some regular white people who aren't that dumb. Now, I know some dumb ones, but I'm just kind of like, they're making it sound like white women can't get it and that they have to be all the way stupid. And I'm like, that's not even realistic. I don't even, most of the white women I know don't, they're just not that dumb. Like they're, let me just move on. I don't know. So I think that's the reason why I was just getting irritated. And if I was a white woman, I think, I think I would be irritated. Like my goodness, like so many of them see some of the shenanigans. And so I just think that they, overproduced some of the shenanigans. So whatever, move on. I just feel like um, the one thing that was said, and I can't remember who said it, was they said, look, oh, it was Kelly Goff. She made another poignant point. She said, look, it's people do mix up people within other races. I've done it. She said, all you need to do is really just own it and move on. It doesn't negate you as a person and any of the good work. And I wanted to, the reason why I pointed out that that point was, you know, let me just say this. And this is just my opinion. Hold on, hold on. Let me get my little banner up, you know, because everything's alleged and just my opinion and all that good stuff. This is my opinion. And not all Black people are going to necessarily agree with me. This is how I feel. I feel, oh, do I, can you guys see me? Should I take off this thumbnail? I'll take off that thumbnail. Okay, so this is what I think. There are people who genuinely just want to do the right thing and to understand and to also just live their lives and all these other things. And my opinion is this. 
you have to allow people the space, even when they're doing the work, right? Because this is the thing. Check, I mean, listen, I want to lean in on this. When you become aware that there's things that are going on, there's injustices and all kinds of stuff, right? And then you 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 set out to educate yourself. You may read a book, you may enter into spaces that are not typically your own. What oftentimes happens is because, like, for example, I know Black people who are still quite angry, and justifiably so, I feel there still has to be some grace and there will be mistakes made, right? So you kind of like course correct and you move on. I don't like to continuously demonize. And I say this because yes, white people, Asian people, Latina people, they have access to the same books and Google and internet, but what they haven't really, really had to deal with was learning by heuristics. So what, what do I mean by that? Black people have to enter into white spaces every day. We are used to tone policing and code switching. We're used to having to go into um, white restaurants and white stores and all these other places. And when you are, I'm going to say, a white woman or whatever, and you're not used to having to do that because you don't have to. And now when you're trying to learn and educate and, and, and do some of the work and you're trying to get it, what happens is they've never really had to learn the heuristics, the by heuristics, the nuances, those rules of thumb, right? So while black people on a daily basis, we go into white spaces and we have to learn all these things and we know how to do these things. There's, there's nuance there, right? There's a lot of nuance there. Well, white people haven't had that practice. And now what happens is because, and I get it. Like I understand the anger of black people. Like they should get this. Why do I have to teach them? I'm like, you're right. You shouldn't have to teach, but it is what it is. And so what happens is when someone who's white or Latina or, or Asian or whatever, when they're trying to, and I would say primarily white, primarily white. Okay. They're trying to figure out like, well, how can we coexist? How do I get to know you a little better? Doesn't mean we're besties but how do I get this? And then they make a mistake and then we demonize them. And then they feel like they can't say anything. They can't do anything. And I'm not co-signing bad behavior. I'm not making excuses for white guilt and all that stuff like that. I'm not doing that. But what I am saying is my thing is generally speaking, when I'm feeling not pissed off about something else, I try to provide a little bit of grace. Now I'm still going to side. I'm like, all right, ding -a Like, but I personally am not going to demonize somebody over and over and over again because I don't have the mental cycles. Unless you're just like an a-hole, then, you know, I'm, I'm going to give you a-hole like, you know, responses if I feel like giving you the cycles. So with that being said, when she made that comment, hey, <laughs> white people mix up black people all the time, right? Like we all look alike or whatever. Kind of like when people mix up all Asians, right? What she said was, you got to own it and then you, you almost like move on. So she was like, it, when you make those mistakes, it doesn't negate all of the effort and, and work that you've done before. It doesn't make you a bad person. It just really just means like, hey, you, you, you had a ding dong moment. She didn't use those words. So I got it. And I'm hoping that other people will take that into consideration. But that's just how I move forward in life because I, I, I just can't be in that space where I'm constantly angry. I've got enough with my kids, like not folding their clothes and other things that gives me like anxiety. So we're going to move past that. So they wanted to introduce. Um, so when they were bringing in LTW, now they switched over to Naya and Miranda. And I remember when I watched the real episode, I loved the scene with Miranda and Naya. It was like when Miranda wasn't doing that whole weird, like, hey, like, like with the teeth and all that, you know, it's just kind of like, okay. But what they were saying was, and it's hard for me to break this down. They were saying like, they wanted to have the car. Let me bring this up so I can read, you know, I am middle age, so I can't see stuff. So they wanted to have the car hard conversation around becoming a mother. Um, Michael Patrick King talks about it being torturous. What does he know about being a mother? 
Like all I kept thinking was, uh, where's my where's my little situation? I changed it so it wasn't too like tacky like the last time I used it. I just wanted him to shut up. What do you know about it being so torturous? Like, this is the reason why when I was looking at my thumbnail, go back to the thumbnail, all I kept thinking was he talks too much. He should just take a big dose of shut the F up and stop talking. So every time, like, Kelly wanted to mention something poignant, he wanted to chime in like he was, like, all-knowing. Like, he was... um the freaking wizard in the Wizard of Oz, like pay no attention to the man behind the on the curtain. Like I'm like, shut up. Like what do you know? <laughs> so anyway, he's like, yeah, it was just torturous. And then um, I can barely read this. What did I write? He gets up to the scene. What? Oh, he sets up the scene where he said he should have let the writer. Oh, he likes to set up scenes. That's what I was saying. Whereas I'm like, wait a second. This the the. The keynote writer or the writer of interest for these episodes, let them set it up. You don't need to set it up. And I don't understand why he felt like he wanted to talk so much about motherhood. I'm like, what do you know about motherhood? You don't know. You will never know what it's like to be a mother. Period. Period. So basically, with the writer, which was Kelly Goff, she brought up that she... Um, chose not to have children. Now, let me say this. This is really, really important. Let me take my little thing off. Hold on, hold on. Let me take it off. Let me take it off. Now look at me. I'm probably skipping ahead, but she brought up a good point. As a Black woman saying she doesn't want to have children, it was significant. Now this is Kelly saying this, and so this was reflected in Naya. And the reason why it's important is um, there's so many stereotypes and data points out there. Black women are getting married later. Um, black men and black women are not marrying. There's all these statistics. You've got, um, if, you, if you are of a certain status or whatever, you fall into a certain percentage and all this and stuff like that. And so what happened was she said, it becomes almost like this, this, Thing about eugenics where you're trying to like strengthening the gene pool right because you should want to have these children like as a woman as a an affluent or or an intelligent black woman as someone who's not in jail like basically she was saying like here i am in this situation where um i should want to have children right but it was just one of those things where she was just like i didn't want to have children and how do you bring that up within this, this the black society but not just black women any woman any woman who has decided not to procreate is kind of like <gasps> you know like gasp so i just don't understand why he felt the need to to run his mouth i'm like shut up i cannot i cannot believe how opinionated he is on things like that and present them in a way that makes me as a viewer feel lousy yes he does i i i, I just i I don't understand. <laughs> I just feel like I wish they had a call in uh, segment. I know they can't have one. They probably, I'm not really known, but I'm going to like be a narcissist. Think it's all about me. They probably have my face on some wall throwing darts at it. They're like, nope, not this one. She's got too much to say. I just kind of felt like, why would you sit there and say that this conversation around motherhood and people not wanting to have children or have children was like tortur torturous. I'm like, what do you know about any of that? Now, what I will say was when I was younger, I was the one who was like, I don't know about all these kids, maybe one. Mm. <laughs> I was like, I don't want to be a mom. I was young and I was enjoying my life. I was traveling. Um, I got to focus on me. Um, I was learning over time how to set boundaries. Um, it's just, I at that point in my life, never felt like my clock was ticking to right about 28, 29. But even still, like I knew I wanted to have maybe one. I didn't know I wanted to have more kids until I had more kids. And that was because, um, I don't know. <laughs> but I will say this. There are women out there who don't want to have children 
and people look at them like you have everything this you, you'll be perfect you're beautiful you're smart you're this you're that some people think it's just money and a lot of women maybe they've had trauma in their life whatever it is maybe they just don't want to have children so i just felt like when this Kelly Goff was talking. She was just bringing up some really just like good points. Whereas these other writers were just literally like licking themselves like cats. Cause they were like, I'm amazing. And they were like, Oh, Michael Patrick King, you're just so amazing. I just love you in every way. Just gag. So anyway, she's basically saying when she had that, she was talking about that scene with Miranda when they were going back and forth. And Miranda's like, look, this is before Miranda became like true Satan. She's like, look, you're, it's, it's okay to like want to have children or not want to have children, but it's okay when you do have them, like, and you love them. And she's like, and you may not feel like you love them all the time. She was saying those uncomfortable things that when women start getting honest in their later years, you know, that Naya needed to hear. She's like, you know, there's times I just want to be by myself and you don't really want to go home or whatever. So just to give a, a little, like something anecdotal, there's a running joke with one of my um guy friends. He says, are you sitting in the office? Like when I would come home and I still do this sometimes, I take a few extra moments in my car because it's like my safe space. Because when I walk in this door, it's like, mom, can you sign this? Hey, I got to do this. Hey, we got to go to practice. Hey, we got to have dinner. I can't find my soul so I don't know what to do. Like just last night, I was having a who's on first moment with my son because he was acting like he'd never heard of a washing machine. And he comes downstairs with all these clothes. I don't have any clean clothes. And I'm like, I'm not going to tell you what I really said because it was quite colorful. But it was something on the lines of what the uck do you want from me? <laughs> I was in that. I was literally in that space. I just wanted to be left alone. I'm like, well, what do you want from me? And, you know, when you're constantly having people, like you just, sometimes you don't want to be a parent. I'm like, why can't you get it together? This isn't hard. All you have to do is go to school and stop talking. You have one job, which is one job. So, and that's like on some low key stuff. But when you're constantly having to deal with certain things and when Miranda was saying like, look, just like, People cannot feel that love all the time. Like I got what she was trying to say or something along those lines. I'm probably butchering the actual quote. But what Kelly was saying and when she was having that conversation with Cynthia Nixon and um, Karen Pittman, that's the one who plays Naya. She said that when they were going back and forth and they were flushing, flushing out this character and this converse, these conversations and I kind of like got it. Because there's many of days where I'm just kind of like, I, I'm checking out. I don't want to be a parent anymore. Like, I literally tell my kids, like, I'm not parenting anymore. You need to raise yourselves. Raise yourselves. Because you guys need to start figuring some things out. I'm, I'm just not that kind of mom right now. So um, anyway, so while she's actually speaking halfway intelligently, you have Michael Patrick King. I don't know if it was like Tourette syndrome. I don't know even... Why did he even have to talk? I don't even know why he was there. All he should have done was introduced her and he closed out the show. She could have just had this conversation. What are their names again? With Julie Rottenberg and Eliza Zeritsky. I don't understand why he had to even talk. He should start all, talking all the way. Just, just not talk anymore. He needs to just record his intros and exits and that's it. That's all he needs to do because he was annoying. All he wants is just to love up on himself. It's weirdo. So anyway, so Kelly just basically leaned in on that whole, I'm not sure if you remember like in a later episode where Naya was talking about black love being a unicorn because you know, there's this whole thing about the black family being under attack and all this stuff like that. And let me tell you, if you talk to many of the black men out there, the ones who are being honest, they they are feeling some kind of way right now. Let me tell you, a lot of them are butt hurt, all the way butt hurt, because they do not like seeing white men with black women in these commercials right now. It is driving, I've heard over and over and over again, many of them bonkers. And there's a lot of reasons behind it. 
<laughs> you agree? <laughs> yeah. He, he needs to not talk. Like he just needs to stop talking all the way. Stop talking. So um, I think the biggest thing was <sighs> Hollywood it, it, entertainment business is, they're not a normal breed of people anyway. You have to be really like an extra type of creative. They they don't live in our world. They don't live in, you know, like our reality, right? And so there is this need for attention and adulation and adoration. Um, he He's just really, he just wanted to center himself. I don't even understand why he was part of the conversation. He just had to jump into and then what we really want. I'm like, we ain't no, shut up. See, like, that's when he needed to be emotionally intelligent and let them just run that podcast. All he needed to do was introduce and end the segment. That's it. He needed to say nothing else. He should have just sat back and ate his fictitious popcorn or whatever and, and should have just been, like, saying, please and thank you. That's all he needed to do. This is why they need to have a calling segment because I'd be like, let me tell you. Oh, my. So, look. Here comes Seema, who's perfect in every way, even though she displayed some imperfection. But she's perfect in every way. So now they introduce Seema again. Like, like they introduce Seema with Carrie. And they said she was unrelated to anything and everybody, everything like that. They introduced her as powerful. Now, this was interesting. She was powerful. She was beautiful. She was a boss. She was everything. Let me read my notes. And she becomes a real friend to Carrie. Now, I have this really, really... Miranda, wait, what? Oh, so there was a little bit of hateration from Miranda because she basically was like, I don't think Seema's gonna last because she does she hasn't met Big yet and all sorts of like that. She didn't know that she didn't know Big, which I was kind of like, I don't know if I really even got that whole comment. Probably because when I was watching that episode, part of it I was falling asleep. But this is what I have a box around. I said, it is important that she was single, talking about Seema. And that she was searching. Now, this was Michael Patrick King talking, but I'm, I don't necessarily disagree with it. They said that she was reflective of a strong, smart, powerful, beautiful, and amazing woman. And then I wrote down, why was that important? So this is what goes on. It said that Carrie wounds Seema. Okay. And they said Seema calls her out. Seema centered herself. Well, this is what I said. I said, well, look. In that scene where Carrie was like kirking out because of the whole um, the, the picture frame was broken or something along those lines. Normally you wouldn't lose any sleep over it, but I, I understood. Oh, that's my nose itching. It was misplaced, you know, grieving over big, blah, blah, blah. And so she kirks out on Seema. And then Seema, in my opinion, she kind of centered herself in that moment, but she, I don't think she was necessarily wrong. I just thought that the timing was messed up. She centered herself and she basically fights back at Carrie and blowing up over the frame. So she was basically like, you know, you're, you're saying certain things about me in this, basically this frame, but just like how you took a shot at me when I'm like, basically when she was referencing being single in her fifties or whatever it was. And so Carrie was like, oh, you're still out there. So basically they were like, Hey, Carrie, you used to be single and now how quickly you have forgotten. And it's kind of like, it was kind of like messed up. Anyway, I thought that was interesting that they, they wanted to bring Seema in that way because um, basically they, were, they wanted to show her as single, but still searching. And Basically, that's it. Like that, that, that is her fault. So he made the comments. So I, I didn't know how to take this. You know, I'm probably I'm just gonna paraphrase. Hold, hold on, let me put my banner back up because I don't want any drama. Here's my my banner. He made the comments. Most of the women that he knows that are beautiful and intelligent and like a boss, and there's they have such strength and all this other stuff they are still searching and single and all these other things. And I agree, kind of, but I don't know. I kind of felt like, who the F do you think you are? Um, but I do see that a lot, but I kind of feel like I, I didn't, I didn't know how to, I didn't even know how to take that. I kind of felt like, are you taking a shot at these women? Um, now 
are there some women who should be single? <laughs> yes, they are like tough. They're tough on everything. And I'm like, you don't have to be tough on everything. You don't have to win everything, right? Like you don't have to win. Like it, what's the upside? You won, but now what, right? But I will say, <sighs> many of the women that I see who were kind of like that, they almost had to be that way for a reason. And when you have a sharp swing of the pendulum to one side, it's so difficult to swing back to the center. Um, but I also feel like it's putting the responsibility on this woman solely on the women for if you're strong, intelligent, smart, um, a boss, you just have it together as if like you are the problem. I think that when you have that female archetype, my personal opinion, hey, I've been wrong before, I'll be wrong again. I think there are men who struggle with that. So what happens is it's easy to put this blame on the women. It's your fault that you're smart and you're beautiful and you're driven and you're a boss and you're all these things. You are the problem. It can't be the men. Um, and then what happens is I think there's like this vicious cycle because for whatever it is, whatever um, maybe profession or whatever, wherever they are in their lives, they almost had to be. And so I, I don't know. I, I struggle with that. I, I struggle with it a whole lot because I feel like there's almost like there's this, this penalty. There's this penalty. There's a price to pay. So that's not to say that I'm not smart and intelligent and all those things like that. But I think I know some women who it's tough. It is tough. Like, it, yeah, you can't, they, they, they don't know how to give. They don't know how to like, just, yeah. But I just, I don't know why I just kind of was just mad that he said it and it's not right. I don't know. I don't know why it just, I don't know. I, I felt like I just wanted to like, I don't know take my ball and go home. Like I was feeling really petty in that moment, all the way petty. And I, I can't even really explain why I was so irritated that he said it, but it didn't mean it wasn't true in some, some sort of way, but I don't know. I'm interested to see what you guys think. And then um, let me just say this and then I'll be done. They were talking about Willie Garson's character and how, they wanted to film his the, the scene. There was a scene where um, he was supposed to be with Carrie and he said he was questioning where he was in his life. And he said, all I am doing is mar uh, managing a TikTok star. And Carrie was supposed to say, well, you, you only live once or something like that and, and go see some gay shows or whatever for me or whatever. He was supposed to film that scene um within two days, but he called and said, I, I just can't, you know? So they, they had to do a, a hard cut and just, he was already in Japan and ran off and blah, 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 but it made everyone sad. And, you know, I appreciated the fact that they wanted to pay homage to who he was and what he brought to the series and that they were sad. Um, I don't know. I thought this writer's room podcast was an interesting episode episode four um because the previous ones were i was just like i can't deal with i just can't yeah yes it's, it's the way he said it i think so i mean so you must have already <laughs> heard this something I, I i don't know um resourceful jill let me put you back up there i think with michael patrick king i think he i don't think he was reading the room Maybe that's what it is. And and I don't know. Like, I think it was the way he said it. It was the fact that he said it. Like, I don't know why it bothers me so much. I'm just kind of like, I should just let it go, right? I I think maybe I just feel a little bit protective of women because um, th there's no winning in this society, right? Like, if you're intelligent and, you, you know, like, you're, you're not dateable or something or... If you've been successful, then you slipped your way to the top. And there are people who do that. I won't call out any names because I've seen it. 
<laughs> Sorry, you said thank you. Um, because you see people in a way that's multifaceted. Maybe that's what it is. I don't know, but I just I don't know. Like I'm just I'll put it like this. I think when it comes to women, I feel like with women, it's like we we can't we can't be multiple things at once. We can be only one thing. We can be beautiful. We can be smart. We can be a mother. We can have a career. Like we can't be all these things, right? I mean, I don't know. I just, I don't know. I just wanted to like push him on the floor or something. I don't know. I'm just really petty. <laughs> I just don't like that people keep wanting to come after women. Now it could be because um, when I first started again, I started recording videos, August, 2021, like literally, I don't know where I was like, this is trash out here on YouTube, right? I joined YouTube and the first things I see on here, like, let me tell you how much of a ding dong I was. It was a whole bunch of stuff on the manosphere. And I was like, well, what is the manosphere? Now I'm going to go off topic for a second. Now, I've always been a faux feminist. I'm not like a real feminist, right? Because feminism, what it is today, it's been co-opted into something else. The old definition of feminism was basically like equality among the sexes. So that women had like equal rights to vote, to own property, et cetera. What it has turned into today is something else. Okay. So when I first got on YouTube and I'm seeing all this stuff on the manosphere and I didn't know what it was. I'm like, what is this thing called the manosphere? And then when I looked it up and I'm looking at how these men were just going in on women and the things that they were saying, and, and it was just disgusting. It was disgusting. And I just kind of felt like, wait a second, well, why is there this, this anger towards women and all this other stuff? And I think for me, I just feel like, wait a minute, wait a minute, because men just seem to have this bigger voice and a bigger platform. So they get to say and spew out anything they want. There's no repercussions. It doesn't have to be true. And then when you, when you get impressionable minds, you get these impressionable minds, they say you can give a poor man um, a cause. No, what is the, it's something about poor man and people with no families and cause. I forget. But anyway, the point is when you have a group of hurt people, it's like you give them the talking points, you give them a cause, you give them a community, right? And so when I would see this and I'd see the vitriol that was coming out and it was just kind of like, there's a level of hatred, some low key hatred. And so I just, I've always had like a protection for women, but when I started seeing that stuff, it was so disgusting and, and misogynistic. And furthermore, there's a lot of misogynoir. So Fast forward, listening to Michael Patrick King, who I think is a gay man, I don't know. Um, I just kind of felt like I don't need you to say anything about women right now. That's just where I'm at with it. I don't need you. I don't want you. I, I don't want you to try to chime in. It's kind of like when, you know, people want to chime in on what it's like to be a black woman or a white woman. Or like, like sometimes you like, just listen. Just listen. So I felt like he just doesn't know how to read the room. And he's just like so self-centered. And I really think that they need to have a call-in section session and have just me on there first so I can get it all out and just get everybody all the way together. But that's just me. So look, um, I'm going to like end this because this is going way too long. But look, hopefully you guys all enjoyed it. Um, I halfway enjoyed this one probably because... Um, Kelly Goff didn't give me ding dong vibes. It was a little bit of sucking up in the beginning. Um, if Michael Patrick King would have just shut all the way up and let the women, because this was a very women's issues focused um, episode. It wasn't like just social issues. It was like very focused on women, womanhood type stuff. And that's when he should have just bowed out and he should have been emotionally intelligent and said, you know what, I'm going to let them run this. If you're going to talk about racial stuff or classism or I don't know, whatever, then yeah, whatever. But these were kind of like, in my opinion, 
nuanced topics that he didn't need to jump in on. And for whatever reasons, when he made that comment about her, uh, Seema's character being intelligent and beautiful and, you know, all these things, but she's still out there searching and she's single. It was as if it was an albatross. It, it gave me like scarlet letter vibes. Like she was Hester Prynne wearing this scarlet letter, like single lady. And I'm like, is, is being single the equivalent of having a scarlet letter? Maybe that's not the desired state for some, but is it the scarlet letter? Like, well, you're single, so you're worthless. Like you have no place. Like you're, you're, I don't know. He just needs to shut up. That's it. That's, that's where I'm at with him. All right. Let me get off of here. Cause I'm doing too. Oh, I see another comment. Um, and she said, and then you, you talk on YouTube about beauty and fashion, style and art. That's the Aphrodite architect. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Oh, I think I missed some of it. I'm sorry. Let me go back up where you were. Um, you see different archetypes. I read the beginning of your book and you have several archetypes that stand out immediately. What book? I'm trying to think which one. Okay. You, at least partially, a scholarly achievement-oriented lady. That's Athena Artemis. Okay, I see where you're going. Uh, and then you talk on YouTube about beauty, fashion, and style. Are that... I don't really talk about fashion and style and art. Maybe you got me confused with somebody else because um, that's not really what I get into. Um, I will poke fun at Black femininity, okay, because um, there is this, this trend right now in Black femininity where in order to be seen as feminine, it's actually taking on European, European uh, or Eurocentric standards. If you look at what's out there, they're showing black women. Everybody has the same long leg with the same baby hairs that they lay down, which is, you know, whatever. Okay. There, and the, this notion of femininity is I must wear tons of makeup. And let me just say this. I don't think there's anything wrong with makeup. But when you look at how much, and it's like so extreme, all the eyelashes and everything, and, and like there's a time and a place for all of that. Like there's nothing wrong with being dressed up. But you got women who are wearing makeup several shades lighter than what they are. And I'm like, okay, see what you're doing is you're telling me a lot by saying, without even saying anything, you can show me better than you can tell me because I'm like, you're not confident. You're three shades lighter than what your normal skin tone is. I'll leave that there. So there's this whole thing going on right now with black femininity because they're trying to figure it out because they've been told for so long that black women are not feminine. Now I can get, that's a whole other discussion. I don't want to get into that because that's going to change the contest content context of this. But yeah. Um, and you said, and being a mom, having a relationship, those are the meat and hair. Okay. I know I'm going from Greek mythology. Yeah, you're just starting to get above me, but I've been reading Jean. Shunoda Bolin's book, and it resonates. I'm not sure who she is, but I need to write it down so I can educate myself. So I think, why is my pen, Jean Shinoda Bolin? I think the biggest thing is it's just that um, he didn't need to talk. And that's just where I'm at with it. So, all right. You, you're welcome to come up here if you want to... Um, let me see, do I have that on there? I'll give you a second to, to speak. I just posted it. It's probably easier for you to speak versus for me to try to recap what you're saying. Um, you seem to be speaking about something that I don't know a whole lot about. So, um, but anyway, that's it. Um, all right. I'll give you a couple of seconds. Just let me know. You can always just say no. Or if I don't hear from you in the next like 10 seconds, I'm just going to end this live. Oh, Lord Jesus. So. All right. So look, thanks for, thanks for tuning in. I know this one went quite long. I did not hate this writer's room episode four podcast. It wasn't bad. All right. Thanks a lot. Oh, yeah. Yes. You want to come up? What is yes? What does that mean? I'm not sure what that means. All right. Maybe you're just a troll, but. You seem to be pretty thoughtful. <laughs> I wasn't sure what yes means, but all right. Oh, there she is. Okay, hold on a second. I mean, I'm going to add you in. There you go. Hello. Hi. I wasn't sure what yes means, but all right. Oh, there she is. Hello. Is that me? Yeah, I see you. I'm trying to figure out why am I echoing. Give me a second here. 
Um, I'm going to turn off my sound on this end, so it's only one. Yes, yeah, so you got to take. You got to exit. Oh, that doesn't work. Yeah. Hi. Hi there. Hi. There you go. You're going to have to exit out that tab. If you have YouTube open, you got to exit out altogether. Okay. Hello. It's Hi so there. nice to meet you. And I love watching your videos. And this is just absolutely lovely. So, Thank you. Um, I really appreciate everything that you're saying. And um, I, I think it makes tremendous sense just uh, from my perspective regarding um, how they spoke to all of the viewers and how they just really tried to, I think they box everybody in, in ways that really got very uncomfortable. Yeah. 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 I, th I think, I think the biggest thing was they assumed that the viewer was less than smart. And I think that's why everyone was so uncomfortable. <laughs> so. Yeah, absolutely. And more so, I think the writers, they didn't have to be so lazy because you can allude to so much. Like, we'll get it. Yeah. Anyone who has any sort of critical thinking, they'll get it. Yeah, absolutely. So, but all right. Well, I, I look, is there something else that you wanted to mention? Or? No, um, I can't think of any other more specifics, but I think <laughs> that they really, well, they really what you were saying about what they did to SEMA and how it almost seems like they're taking shots at how women relate. And yeah. I, I can't fathom it. So, yeah. And I, I think not only that, but what, what, it, what it was is I felt like there was this undercurrent, almost like, I don't want to call it a pecking order, but more so like her value had, I don't know, because it was just the way he said it. It made it seem like her value was different. Like, well, she's still searching and single. And I didn't like that. I just, I, 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 whatever reason, I just, he just needed to not. Like, I think it's really insulting. It was very insulting. Yeah. So like, like, so what does that mean? Like, yeah. she's smart, but she's still single and insulting. So at the end of the day, now, let me, I will say this. Yeah. As humans, we all want to generally speaking mate whether it's with the same sex or the opposite sex like we want companionship and we want to mate and we want all those things so yes in general we want companionship and that type of thing but i kind of felt like was her va like value lessened because she didn't have someone tethered to her like <laughs> and i just yeah. didn't like you said it it was just too much <laughs> But that's, um, that's why the book that you wrote down is all about um, the value and the path that we all take and the way that the journey can take different directions. And if a person is focused on one piece of it, so finding, um, figuring out their career, and then the relationships don't always work out or they might, and it's the balance point of all of it. And reducing it to saying, oh, well, she's strong in these regards. She's this boss lady where it's like the um, she needs to be more multifaceted. That I would say she already is multifaceted. I think the thing that I, I hate is when men apply... Yes what society would deem as masculine characteristics to women. Yeah. She's so strong. <laughs> so yeah, that's I why think, I, think it was, <laughs> I think it was how you said it. Um, and I phrased it badly because um, what you were saying is how they were reducing her in describing it in the writer's room, as opposed to seeing her being that strong character and really not having any judgment on her in that regard, I think it's what Michael Patrick King and the others said that makes it like, wait, I didn't see that. I saw a lady who's doing well in a lot of ways. I don't get yeah. it. And that, that I think that's why and I, I'll, I'll leave you with this. And yeah. within the Black community, yeah. with this whole femininity movement and stuff like that, there's a strong push for removing the language of strong Black woman. And there's even grumbling of removing black girl magic because 
the whole concept around that was, I mean, it's, it's a great concept, but also people feel like, well, why do we have to be magical? Why can't we just be? Well, it's okay to just be. Why can't we just be a, a black woman? Why do we have to be extraordinary? Why do we have to be strong? So I've, I've got other videos out there where I was mentioning, I, I like to call in Shakari Richardson. I'm not sure if you know who she is. She was the girl, the young, the young lady, the young woman who did not qualify for the Olympics because she was enjoying herself and uh, with, with, with uh, some, some substances. And she is a talent that hasn't produced as extreme as she should. And I think the reason why she stands out right now is not necessarily for her talent. It's for her, um, it's for other reasons. And so basically right now within the community, there's this, this, this notion that like black women have to be extra just to be visible. You have to have orange and red hair and the, the talons and you have to do all these things. You have to make a song like wow. You know, you have to do all of these things to be visible and you have to be magical and you have to be strong. So now there's this push to say, OK, let's stop applying these 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 terms, this terminology towards us. We don't have to be strong. We don't have to be magical. Why can't we just be and be? Absolutely. And that's where they're, that that's like the push. Now, I don't typically talk about that level of detail um, just because I don't think most people really want to deep dive on that. Maybe they do. But there is this conversation around that. Like, what does femininity mean? And, you know, like, does it mean getting painted? It could be, but it's it, it goes deeper than that. And like I said, when it comes to femininity, and I'll, I'll circle back to Seema, a lot mm -hmm. of things you'll see with Black women, you just see these extreme things. Well, society says femininity is long, straight hair. So everyone's getting these long wigs, talons, big boobs, booty, all this, like, like, like extreme everything. It's almost like clownish. It's like clownish, extreme everything. So the makeup is extreme. It's beautiful, but it's so extreme. Like everyone's got to be contoured. Every, it's like everything. And so what happens is it's, it's like the modern day minstrel or something. So when I look at like Seema, when I li when he made that comment and I, he he probably didn't think anything of it. He probably thought he was giving a compliment. And I think maybe I'm just hypersensitive to it. It's kind of felt like, why can't he just shut up? <laughs> How about that? How about he just be quiet and let the woman run that? Yeah. He well, just that can't Yeah. Yeah. So. I, I think that um, when you come from any group, any culture, a lot of times there is that sense of, um, am I enough as I am? Mm -hmm. And who's to judge, you mm -hmm. know? And so I feel really fortunate uh, where I live in New York. There are so many people that just are themselves. And mm -hmm. it's not all of that extra. I mean, if you want to do it, and I know I know, ladies who love the... Um, the fancy hairstyling and getting the... Um, you know, everything just so with like the jewelry, with the style, with making themselves feel extraordinary. And I hope it's for them because um, it can be very beautiful. But I think that um, it's, it's a sad thing to feel like you have to present something extra just for what another person might want to see. Yeah. I hope that makes sense. It, it actually does. You know, um, mm -hmm. a buddy of mine, sometimes when I do panels is CBR kid. He's one of my favorite people. I know him from work. We were talking about um, me being on this platform one time. Mm -hmm. And I told him, I said, you know, when I get on this YouTube platform, I'm usually, they, they see me exactly how I am. Now, yeah. for the record, I do put on makeup and all that stuff and get all dolled up because I like that kind of stuff too. Yeah. But the everyday woman is not doing this every day. They're not doing that every day. I don't do that every day. So when I get on, you see me, I'm tired. I got the darkness under my oh, eyes. My hair and, is I'm, and I'm at the end of my day too. I had parent teacher night tonight. 
And so I have just a tiny bit of makeup and I'm just, I'm so done. I have to right. get things settled for the rest of the night and get everybody to bed and then it's done. So exactly. And that, and that's what I was going through. So when I, like I was on this live earlier and I'm like, my husband was yelling at my son. I'm like, I'm not alive. You know? yeah. <laughs> I was waiting for mine to do the <laughs> but it is what it is and it's kind of it's exactly what's going on and so like my hair's in a little bun wrapped up and you know it just is what it is I just wanted to show like yeah. this is womanhood not to say that womanhood isn't being pretty and not that I'm not pretty but what I'm saying is I just wanted them I wanted people to see regular women because when you see what's out here on these platforms everyone is filtered and done up and and, and 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 everyone has the right to choose how they want to show up. Mm-hmm. I chose to show up this way, which I still think this is good enough too. Now yeah. there's going to be times when I show up like, yes, honey. <laughs> yeah. Because that's cool. But that's not, that's not everything you need to be. Yeah. So, yeah. but I, I was just saying, getting back to SEMA, I just felt mm-hmm. like it wasn't, a, and I could be overthinking it. I could be very, um, hypersensitive to it but I just felt like he didn't need to say anything he could just all the way be quiet <laughs> just yeah. be quiet. I, I don't know why they took and I don't I know you want to go in a minute and I don't want to hold you on this um but I, I I just can't fathom why they took women who were so proficient um Charlotte who owns a gallery in New York City and she acts like she's never spoken to different people from different cultures, you know? And it's like, you didn't have any artists who weren't white women, who weren't like um, absolutely just, I, I don't get it. And- You're in New York Miranda, City. Corporate lawyer, Miranda. And, <laughs> and what you said earlier um, I about how women can say things and make mistakes and that they get demonized when people are so ready. I, I think that people have gotten, um, I think people are so scared of hurting each other's feelings and saying the wrong thing. It yeah. makes it so hard sometimes to know and to make those honest mistakes out of, you know, out of the goodness of when you try to say, and just to not understand you know, and I, I think that the sensitivity um, of what you said about knowing that it's not always meant to be stupid or hurtful. It's just not knowing. Yeah. Really, and I, yeah. Well, right now we're in a culture where yeah. everybody wants to be angry. Everybody wants a movement. Everybody yeah. wants to to. I don't know. It's, it's it's just a lot, and I just kind of feel like sometimes you just need to just say what you need to say. And I'm not saying go out, saying go out of your way to be a jerk, but what I am saying is sometimes people just make these mistakes, and you can still like be offended as you should, correct it if you want to, because you don't always have to correct. Like I don't feel like you actually always have to correct, but I'm like, but I can't always operate in this this angry space too. I like, can't. That's a lot for me. I'm just yeah. kind of like. You're an a-hole. And then I move on. <laughs> oh, believe me. There are times. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think if we can find a way, like, so I, I don't like to try to like police how everyone should feel and, and, and what they should do. But I do know people who have been, well, we've all been hurt. But when I speak specifically, I think about black men um, who, who've been through some things. They've dealt with some things. Like when I talk to some of my buddies who really, dealt with some <laughs> situations. So yeah. for that individual or set of individuals, it is really difficult for them to, like, I get it. And so a friend of mine, when she said, why is it that when I'm trying to talk with some black people, like they're just so angry with me and I'm trying to make it right. And I said, this is what you're going to need to understand. And I want you to catch this. It's not going to make you feel good. You can't, you're not going to be able to talk to everybody. You're not going to be friends with everybody. Some people are still just not going to like you. Just like I know there's still going to be white people who are just not going to like me. I accept it. And I don't put my my cycles into that. I'm like, okay, he's just going to be that way. It, it is what it is. And I'm like, and you're going to have to get with some acceptance that like, you know what? Believe it or not, 
not everybody's going to want to like you because you're white. Like they're going to always think you're the bad guy and you're going to have to accept it. You can't change people. You can yeah. worry about what you're doing and, and, and live your life and you do the best you can. And that's mm -hmm. it. I mean, and, and people are justified to feel the way they want to be. All It's not the way I operate, but I don't police other people's feelings. So it's beautifully said and you're right. And people are coming from places where either they've experienced something like that. Uh, and I have a friend too, who told me a horrible story. I won't, I, I don't want to share her business, but it was definitely a racial situation. Um, and she was judged. Um, and um, this is, this is a lady who is black who has a brother who was um, accused of something that he was a kid, he was 17. And she came home to a situation where he was being confronted. And I'd be terrified. I have a younger brother too. If it were reversed where my brother was being cornered and there was all that tension, I'd be terrified. Yeah. And you know, I'm honored just that um, to 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 have an opportunity to just be be a friend, just to to try to just be open to the friendships, you know, yeah. not be judging because I know, and you're absolutely right. You know that it's hard, and some people have been through it, and some people know it from family, from whatever else, uh, friends, or just, just growing up with it. And it's not easy. It's not. But what I will say is getting back to the show and then yeah. I got to run. Yeah. The writers, yeah. they can introduce all of these social uh, issues and, 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 and such yeah. in a much more clever way. I think if they would just had allowed the characters the room to breathe and the episodes to breathe, make the episodes longer or give us more episodes, this could have been so much better. And also, it didn't help that Miranda was, was Satan. She's like, ah, doing that weird thing with her teeth. And, <laughs> and, and Gerald's writing. Can we talk justice for Steve? Poor Steve. <laughs> Steve. Poor Steve. I don't know what's going on. I don't know where his parents went. I don't know what's been going on. These are not the characters we have. Yeah. Um, Miranda turned into Satan. So I, I, I'm i going to call her Satan until she's not Satan. <laughs> more like when you call her dumb, dumb Miranda. It's oh, like, dumb. Oh, yeah. Oh, like yeah. Dumb, 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 dumb and so, dingling. Yeah. So, I don't know why I like coming up with creative names that aren't too, you know, like cussery. <laughs> so, but. Dum dum dinglings, those all work for me. But all right, I, I want to well, thank you for coming on. Um, thank you for having me. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. I do oh. need to get off because I am quite tired and now my day starts early. <laughs> oh, be well and thank you. Thank you. Have Absolutely. a good night. So I am going to end it here. And uh, well, how do I do this? Okay, take care, Jill. Take care, Asia, right? Yep. Yep, take good care. Yep. Bye. Okay. Um, all right. Let me get on out of here. Black opinionated woman. <laughs>